Nahor, Egiga Fora, Igubloi for Rusula Hu, Holaka Hola, Alago. Howdy, and welcome back to Film And, the only show that discusses film and... (laughs) Well, I'm Dan, your host, and we have another exciting tier list, something I've been personally building to since this summer, and boy, we have a lot to get through today. This is a very big episode. Um, Let me take you back to June 2021. Uh, I was in my apartment working night after night on my senior film screenplay for class that was only a few short weeks away and I walk out to take a break and see my roommates and many more of their friends watching a little film called The Fast and the Furious. Uh, You know, the original 2001 film that kickstarted a now two-decade franchise that has grossed Universal Pictures over six billion dollars. Billion! Um, my roommates go on to explain that they're watching all eight currently released movies over the next three days in preparation for the new installment of Fast and Furious, entitled F9. And I know in the back of my head I'll want to get through the franchise at some point, so I avoid any time that they are watching them in the living room, so I don't really get spoiled on any of it. This goes back even further to a time when my friend of the show, Steve, known for announcing Best Supporting Actress at the second annual Andes, <laughs> described to me with fervor the absolutely stunning naming system of the Fast and Furious franchise. Their logic for naming each movie seems fitting enough, uh, as each movie seems to have been named quite fast, and it makes me furious. <laughs> So I go back to my room to continue writing my screenplay with the thought in my head that only days earlier I had instituted a painful goal for myself. Uh, I would not watch another movie until I finished my screenplay, so as not to distract me in my apartment, because that's where I was watching all my movies. And as someone who watches movies incessantly when he has time, this was truly torture for me, but I did succeed after not watching any movies for nearly a month. The screenplay was done. However, there was one exception to this experience, one asterisk that looms over my head to this day, because in that month, I broke my promise, the night my roommates went to see F9. I was exhausted, and it was a spur-of-the-moment decision to impulsively jump in the call, race to Essex Cinema with them, and watch a movie. And it didn't distract me from writing in my apartment, so I sort of justified it that way. But I was excited to go into F9 with absolutely no knowledge of the actors, the franchise, the story, nothing. I was going in blind. Excited to, I don't know, honestly just dunk on what was pretty obviously a bloated, big budget, low IQ required action adventure, room room, call racing, and heist film. That's really what I had in my mind going into it. But I'll be honest, something funny happened. I watched the movie with no idea of these people involved, no backstory, no previous emotional attachment, and I ended up liking it. Quite a bit, actually, moving past some weak story points and annoying haircuts. I'm looking at you, Charlize Theron. I had just enjoyed a Fast and Furious movie, and I left the theater puzzled. Why did this movie work for me? How did it somehow pull off what it had? And had I misjudged the entirety of this franchise? So this really became the thesis statement for my now four and a half month journey to finish the Fast and Furious franchise and figure out if F9 really was an apt representation of 20 years of fast calls, daring deeds, and of course, family. This brings us to our latest tier list on the Film Man channel, um, covering every Fast and Furious movie to date, 2001 to present. Uh, our tier list system, as always, is set up in six categories, T, U, V, W, X, Y, T for terrible, U, unfortunate, um, or unfavorable, V for very average, um, W, worth a watch, X for exquisite or X marks to spot, and Y for 
yabba dabba do. To start it off, I will try my best to recount the on and off screen narrative throughout these movies, and sadly, I will not be covering the two short films that were released in 2003 and 2009, which those kind of serve to patch the narrative together. And there's also the unofficial origin story of Han in the unrelated and retroactively included film Better Luck Tomorrow. And real quick, I will try my best to keep light spoilers on plot details and medium spoilers on the franchise. It's hard when talking about movies that continue a narrative. Characters may die or locations may change, and it's impossible to avoid in a tier list like this, but them's the breaks. So let's do it. Summer. The year 2000. Actor Paul Walker has completed the Rob Cohen film The Skulls, and Cohen has secured a deal for an untitled action film for Universal Pictures, approaching Walker with a question, what is your dream action film? Walker suggests a, a mashup of two films, uh, 1990's Days of Thunder and 1997's Donnie Brasco, leading to setting work on a film that is set to follow Paul Walker as an undercover cop infiltrating underground street racing in Los Angeles. Uh, The studio wanted Timothy Oliphant in the role of Dominic Toretto due to the success of the blockbuster Gone in 60 Seconds, but he declined. And boy, thank goodness he did, because that feels like a very weird, weird inclusion. One of the producers actually persisted on Vin Diesel following his performance in 2000's Pitch Black, with Diesel accepting after proposing several script changes, which will be something you see a bit going forward. They borrow the name The Fast and the Furious from a 1954 B film, and the movie's finished, released in 01. And much to the surprise of the filmmakers, it is a massive box office hit. On a budget of $38 million, the film grosses $207 million worldwide, and just $40 million on opening weekend alone. So, how does the original stack up? Honestly? Pretty damn good. Um, I'm happy to report that despite 20 years now passing, the original serves as one of the better examples of high-octane, blood-pumping action movies of the early 2000s. I mean, better than Charlie's Angels, Gone in 60 Seconds, Mission Impossibles 2 or 3, the Brosnan Bond films, or Bad Boys 2. I mean, honestly, the only film I think of its time that stacks up is probably the original Bourne movie, The Bourne Identity, which was released in 2002. The original Fast and Furious for me is such a cool time capsule of Los Angeles and just Hollywood filmmaking in general, but you know, put in at a level that feels very tangible and relatable. I mean, this movie is not too heavy on cheap effects or flashy transitions as a lot of movies of this era were, but it keeps the viewer engaged and stimulated with the kind of crazy world it exists in. Paul Walker's character, Brian O'Connor, is a surprisingly compelling leading man, and the kind of monolithic force that is Vin Diesel is just such a perfect, stoic, cool, and collected character in Dom Toretto. In a way, to balance out Paul Walker's Brian O'Connor, who is always one step away from being exposed as the undercover cop. But honestly, it's the de facto leader, Dominic Toretto, who accepts him into this kind of street racing gang. And a friendship forms, despite each having a distrust and wariness about each other, even when Paul starts to take interest in Dom's sister Mia, played by Jordana Brewster, who I think gives an underrated performance in this movie. She is pretty great. I mean, at one point, um, Jordana Brewster, so Mia Toretto, and Paul Walker, they're at dinner uh, together, and Mia sums up Dom's character aesthetic in just a few short words. (laughs) That's just the way my brother is, though, you know? Dom's like... He's, he's like gravity. You know, everything just gets pulled to him. Even you. Mm-mm. No. No. Ha. <laughs> That's what you think, Paul Walker. Uh, well, I will probably use the actor's name, Paul Walker, way more than his character's name, Brian O'Connor. But after overhearing conversations before context of the movies, I legitimately thought that the character's name was Paul Walker. So I apologize, but I will continue to use that. Um, And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the other major character in this film that will continue to be in future movies. Letty, played by Michelle Rodriguez, who I swear is one of the anchoring voices in this entire franchise. I mean, I would say it is not Fast and Furious without at least 
two of the three between Vin Diesel, Michelle Rodriguez, and Paul Walker involved. And this will evolve, but these three pillars stand as what I feel make this franchise what it is. Anyways, not to spoil the end, but things come to a head with Paul Walker and Dom Toretto as the law closes in and suspicion mounts. Overall, yeah, this is a pretty good movie. <laughs> it's with a good cast, surprising, thrilling moments, while somehow keeping to a down-to-earth aesthetic, so I do have to give it an X tier for X marks the spot, or exquisite. But yeah, moving on. F1 uh, was released in 2001, and the film shattered box office expectations, and a 2002 sequel is greenlit by Summer's End. But there's a snag. Vin Diesel declines to return for the sequel, saying that the screenplay was inferior to its predecessor. The previous director, Rob Cohen, also declined the sequel, opting to develop the film Triple X, a 2002 film, which stalled Diesel in the lead role. Universal, instead, worked to create a standalone sequel with Paul Walker in the lead. Uh, the film was to take place in Miami, and the comedic and overconfident Tyrese Gibson, who worked with director John Singleton on the film Baby Boy, 2001, was hired as Walker's new co-star, Roman. I will somewhat amend my previous statement at this point and say that for me, the duo of Tyrese Gibson's Roman and Ludacris's Tej who are both introduced in this film, and eventually become a duo of sorts, also feel like, in a sense, original cast members to the OG Fast and Furious films, plural. And this will hopefully make sense farther down the line. But essentially, Paul Walker is assigned to a new case, a new underground car racing circuit, pulled further into the seedy underworld of drugs, guns, beautiful women, and I don't know, what, what else is in Miami? Uh, gators? Beaches? Those two. I don't know. Um, the film performs admirably overall. Uh, it made about $30 million more than the last one, doing much better internationally, but worse in America and Canada, which is an interesting development, and I believe the studios may have listened to this, seeing the chance to push further with this movie I think had inadvertently set up as a primary theme in the Fast and Furious movies. I mean, this is a movie that takes place in Miami, Florida, Fall from any pre-established locations of the first, yet tonally the narrative bridge between LA and Miami isn't that wide for a movie like this. People may attribute this more to, like, the following movie, but I don't want to deride credit from this one. The second Fast and Furious, which is entitled Too Fast, Too Furious, if I didn't mention that. But I really feel like this is the movie that allows the Fast and Furious movies not to be stuck in LA. Vin Diesel's lack of attachment to the project comes almost as a blessing in disguise, as we are treated to a brand new story in this overall universe, and every movie after this kind of follows suit, always changing locations and eventually becoming a globe-trotting adventure every movie, with various locations across the world. I mean, this is a movie that says these stories with some links of previous characters can happen anywhere. It's not just a SoCal narrative. And thank goodness! might have gotten real tired of that if every movie took place in LA. So what do I think of it? Um, I think the movie's just alright. Uh, it's not too offensively annoying. It feels like a spiritual sister movie to the first that almost works as Paul Walker movie part two, a continuation of his kind of character through line. This film sets up just as much as the first moving forward, I think, and it has some really unique things that we'll never see again in this franchise, and that, honestly, I might genuinely miss. The raw, down-to-earth aesthetic is less prevalent here, but not by much. It's still really there. I mean, scenes like the interrogation of Malk Boone Jr.'s character in the nightclub is something so torturous and just... Well, real, that no Fast and Furious movie would match tonally with scenes like that. And it's a shame, because this movie pulls some pretty crazy punches at times, especially with the main antagonist, Calder Verone, who's uh, played by Cole Hauser. I mean, overall, it's a surprisingly fun standalone sequel that is worth its place with the better Fast and Furious movies, in my opinion. Though not as iconic and exciting as the first film, I do have to give it a W tier for worth a watch. So, we're two movies in, an impressive first film, a slightly less exciting one to follow, with really no view of a third, but the studio still sees the international success. And as a third movie is considered to further milk the franchise, maybe for a couple more millions before abandoning it, 
kind of allowing it to fade into early 2000s obscurity, the franchise is once again giving a blessing in disguise when Paul Walker also decides to leave, not returning for another movie. So what can Universal do? They reboot the series with none of the original cast, as if this film will be any more appealing for people, stalling Lucas Black from Friday Night Lights and Jawhead fame to be the new leading man. But no longer is the franchise setting its eyes on American call culture. No, they have given the reins to director Justin Lin after being impressed by his 2000 film, Better Luck Tomorrow. And he creates easily the most cult classic film in this franchise, the one that people will draw to and say, that's the good one, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. I mean, this also comes from screenwriter Chris Morgan, subsequently attempting to revive the series primarily for call enthusiasts, focusing on call-related subculture and moving the series to Japan, which contains one of the world's largest automotive industries. So it makes sense. There's kind of some logic coming out of this. In retrospect, this one is a defining moment for the series. And it's a standout project that showed the the variety this franchise had available to them. But on its initial release in 2006, the opening weekend numbers were cut by half. And although international box office numbers remained, it seemed the franchise had lost the support that it had gained stateside in 2001. I mean, this also stands as the only movie released so far between any Fast and Furious movie coming three years after Too Fast, Too Furious, and three years before the fourth movie, simply titled Fast and Furious. And don't ask me why that's the name. F1 and F2 were released two years apart, and every new Fast and Furious movie since the fourth one has been released every two years since 2009. So this one is kind of chronologically on its own. And overall, this movie, this was the movie I was pumped up to enjoy. Everyone told me this was the one to seek out because it was such a change of pace from the rest of the other films and stood as a fascinating crossroads of American cinema and international themes and locations, bringing a unique and kind of bustling subculture of Japan to American mainstream audiences. Sadly, I wasn't particularly impressed with the story or visuals, as, I don't know, for me it still suffers from a lot of 2006-era cliches of visual effects and trends that just come off very uh, unflattering, I guess. Lucas Black's character also isn't particularly likable, and I often don't root for him, but, I mean, if this film brought us anything, it is the addition of the single greatest supporting character of the entire franchise the one who has become a true fan favorite, Han. Much like how Dom takes in Paul Walker, Han takes in Lucas Black's character, a compulsive racer driver, into his native Tokyo and supports him as he tries to find his footing in this new environment, learning a new kind of racing, drifting. And in a move of total screenwriting badassery, Chris Morgan, and this is a spoiler, I'm sorry, kills off Han by the end of the movie. Han, the man, the legend, cut down in his prime, and this moment serves as a true blue crushing moment. Something I kind of associate in my head as being kind of on the level of losing Obi-Wan Kenobi in A New Hope. A mentor character, a fan favorite, killed unexpectedly for true emotional effect. Except those movies deal with a very different kind of Han. Portrayed by Sung Kang, Han was an immediate hit for the franchise, providing the the same kind of subdued, non-braggadocious coolness that made characters like Dom Toretto such a draw to begin with. And I think this is where I strike on something that reverberates throughout the entire franchise that really just grinds my gears, and it just lessens each of these films, and it's the constant braggadocious nature of the culture that is being portrayed. I mean, all this worth and meaning being found in the calls you own and the women you get to sit next to you looking like a boss. And then there are people like Han, Dom, and Paul Walker in a more subtle extent that are above the show-offiness. You know, they aren't in it for the money or the women, but they're in it for the love of calls and the more family-based dynamic that this community can foster. And in a way, having these be all favorite characters, all protagonists, it brings hope to the franchise as a commentary on how our heroes being above all this noise. But most times, and especially moving forward, the movie itself is often not above it. 
you know, it revels in showing the show-offy calls and people. And the movie, in turn, feels like it wants to be so much cooler than it actually is. I mean, it's the movie that shows shot after shot after shot of, I will be honest, objectified hype women dancing over fast calls with sick paint jobs and stoic-faced badasses that are there to brag about it and look cool. And that's, that's what this movie is here to do as well. It wants to exist to look cool. And it's not for a while that we'll kind of transcend that dynamic, though we do have a pretty big switch coming soon. Overall, it's a fine movie for being a thematically and culturally diverse film, but it still falls to some pretty dull action movie tropes, so I'll give it a V tier for very average. So, 2006. Tokyo Drift is released and not much of a hubbub is made about it, but the franchise has again surprisingly done exactly what it needed to, because after this, two major players in the franchise consider a revival, Vin Diesel and Paul Walker, with Vin actually convincing Paul that this will be the first honest sequel to the first Fast and Furious movie. So Universal gets the gang back together, but now has gathered the collective characters of the past three movies, Dom Toretto, Michelle Rodriguez's Letty, Paul Walker, Roman, Tej, and Han. Wait, did I just say Han? Oh, oh yeah, here's something you ought to know. Due to the popularity of Han and the temporal ambiguity of Tokyo Drift, the 2006 movie is actually set nearly 10 years in the future, and the events of Tokyo Drift don't actually occur until the beginning of Fast and Furious 7, which means Han is a part of the next three movies and isn't concurrently killed off until partway through the seventh film, which honestly exists as one of the most interesting and random plotline bumps in really any franchise history. I mean, essentially releasing and creating a film that exists 10 years before it would make sense to release in the chronological story of the overall franchise. What what other movie has done that? I, I don't know. Um, but I'm, I can't complain, let's be real. We get three more movies with Han, and the knowledge of his death looming over every movie honestly becomes a character in and of itself, and it adds just a lot to his character, the depth of knowing something he himself doesn't know, like his own time of death. I mean, it's a fascinating thing that this franchise feels like it kind of just accidentally stumbled into, and it works really well. But essentially, in F4, entitled Fast and Furious for whatever reason, it sees Paul Walker and Dom Toretto reluctantly teaming up to catch drug lord Arturo Braga. For Paul, it's pretty obvious. He's trying to stop drugs. But in a sick twist of fate, it is revealed to the gang that a crony of Braga's has tracked down and killed Letty, Dom's longtime partner and lover in crime. It is my terrible job to share that the Fast and Furious franchise has now killed off yet another favorite character of mine in Letty. But other exciting additions to this cast are John Ortiz uh, as the kind of second-in-command of Braga who is never seen in public and delegates a lot of or through Ortiz's character. And pre-Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot in essentially her breakout role in American film, an associate of Braga in the movie turned to kind of help Dom and Paul Walker achieve their goal. Overall, this is another film I do not mind. I mean, the same issues arise, possibly in greater numbers, but the return of Vin Diesel, Paul Walker, and Han is enough for me to rejoice the movie being the ceremonial end to the first half of the franchise. Because after this film, things in the Fast and Furious franchise really start to change up. And this is also some of the first times that the big budget effect begins to take its toll. And it feels like starting here, and this is the case in every movie after this, with varying levels of effectiveness, the movies shoot to create new moments of action and tension, having creative ideas for fight scenes and driving scenes, but more often than not, the pacing of these scenes and the actions of the characters, both good and bad in these scenes, is just completely unrealistic. The best example is when the person who is revealed to be Letty's killer has Paul Walker at gunpoint near the end of the film, but Dom Toretto drives a call into him, pinning him against another call, and overall it is a great effect, 
But the entire time I'm sitting there asking myself, he has Paul Walker dead to rights now. One bullet and, and Paul Walker is dead. That's it. Problem solved. You could do it right now. But instead, Vin Diesel spends like a solid 12 seconds just driving towards him, and this antagonist just unloads his gun at the undercarriage until he doesn't have time to shoot Paul Walker anymore, and he's killed. Like, he could have just killed Paul Walker, and I'm like, I'm happy he didn't, but he could have, and he could just step to the side, and you know, it is kind of infuriating when this pacing is truly off kilter, and it just feels just wildly unrealistic that the characters would act in this way with the pacing of every action scene and this truly happens time and time again and these manufactured moments of tension just rip you out of the story and it just it feels ridiculous which is it's too bad I mean, this is a trend I feel like I've seen in many big-budget studio action films and that's why I call it the big budget effect because it seems that a bigger a production is I mean it's always trying to one-up its predecessor you know, I mean, things tend to Tokyo Drift fall their way from reality, bad pun, uh, and land in a world of illogical situations and nonsensical character decision making. So overall, I give Fast and Furious, the fourth movie, a V tier, very average. I mean, it's a cool wrap up to the original storyline with new additions to the cast and a seamless melding of all the previous ones, which I do like. Plus, there was a wicked call chase in the Mexico desert that I'll give it to. The ending is pretty exciting. I do love this ending. So, we are halfway through, and it's here that we will honestly have to take a quick PSA break and return with the second half of the franchise, roughly the era 2011 to 2021. And when we return, I will be unpacking the main talking point of this tier list that honestly defines the second half of the Fast and Furious franchise. Running late to class but still need that morning caffeine or hot breakfast to start your day out right? Download the Bite app by Sodexo and place your custom order for fast, easy pickup at Zyme. Open 8.30 a.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. Mondays through Fridays. All right, uh, welcome back to Film Hand, and we are currently halfway through our Fast and Furious franchise tier list. 2011, which is where our next film, Fast Five, is released, is the beginning of a new era for the franchise, one that evokes a concept I came up with a couple weeks ago while working through these movies. This semester, I am actually in a class called Film Topics, a cinematic space odyssey discussing science fiction films. And the constant discussion of science fiction and what makes them what they are got me to continue to break down concepts of genre in honestly all facets of my film watching. And I had a realization, if these movies that we watch in class are science fiction and all that entails, I'm pretty sure that the second half of the Fast and Furious movies are themselves a genre I've decided to call action fiction. And what does action fiction entail? Well, it's traditionally categorized as a literary genre, often manifesting in books, because fiction is kind of the classic designation of books, fiction versus nonfiction. But a movie mentioned previously in this episode, The Born Identity, adapted from a book, is, I think, a watershed moment in action fiction films. While the original 2001 Fast and Furious movie employed very realistic stakes, effects, and action, 2002's Born Identity pushes the idea of what if to justify elevating action and tension in an action film. I think the distinction of action fiction comes from us as viewers, kind of getting the sense that what we're watching isn't possible. Like, films will try to show us the impossible, expose people to the newest, coolest, craziest action scenes yet, but I think within the production and visual aesthetics, I mean, there is a line that gets crossed where the audience is actually attending with the expectation that what gets shown isn't the craziest realistic situation, but true and honest fiction. In Fast Five, the opening scene ends in Paul Walker jumping from a moving train that's going seemingly 200 miles per hour onto the back of Dom's call, which is able to somewhat 
keep up with the train <laughs> in the bumpy desert terrain, he jumps off the train at the last second before it crosses a bridge, which lays over a deep canyon and river. Out of time to break or swerve, the two are launched off of the cliffside, parallel to the bridge, and Paul stands straight up, holding on to the neck brace of Dom's seat behind him, before they fall nearly 150 yards into the river below and emerge fine. This is action fiction, a fantastical situation that, although it is portrayed as possible by the characters, treated as plausible, is clearly an impossible situation and merely for the entertainment or shack value or just spectacle of the film itself. I mean, when Dom or Paul Walker jump calls and race people in the first two films, this is realistic action. It's action portrayed to pee. Wow, that's crazy, but they pulled it off. And the realism grounds the film, and often due to the realism being achieved through practical effects and actual impressive stunt drivers. But as the film industry has evolved, and the franchise has too evolved, action fiction is now how I would classify these films. So, with that being said, let's go into Fast Five. And I forgot to mention this for F4, but starting with F4, and really up until the current Fast and Furious movies, the opening scenes of each of these movies may be some of the best scenes of each film. Like, each of these films start out with such a good, like, opening sequence, they're always just a treat to watch, and I can't recommend them enough. So, with the return of Paul Walker and Vin Diesel in the fourth movie, and with a budget of $85 million, the same as Tokyo Drift, it's actually able to achieve much better returns, not only surpassing the box office gross of the first three films, but making over $130 million more than Too Fast, Too Furious, the previous highest grossing film in the franchise. And upon seeing such good returns, Universal upped the budget of Fast Five to $125 million, an increase of nearly 40%. And from this, Fast Five is able to rake in, wait for it, $626 million, essentially doubling the success of Fast Four, which had already made, again, $130 million than the one before it. And what I find so tough to justify is that for me, this is right when we as the audience stop getting our money's worth out of these movies. And this is the first time, and just the first film, I have to say, is a U-tier film. Unfortunate and kind of unfavorable. Nearly every character begins to annoy me a bit more. I mean, Roman has become a walking punchline with no nuance or development, and his jokes, much like in the previous movies, are grating and unwitty. My theory is you really have to be in on the joke of who Roman is, and right now, in the series, I am just not. Um, I mean, a, no a notable addition to the cast is Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and this is easily one of the worst characters I've seen him play in any movie. I mean, his affectations show just, I mean, for me, it feels like a real lack of understanding from the writers and the actor like, what, who, who this character is. I mean, who is Agent Hobbs, which is The Rock's character? And it just comes off really unflattering. Like, just, it's like some foggy caricature of a law enforcement man who's way too into his profession. I don't know, but he just gets way better as we go along, so this is just a, a, ro a rocky stalt, but it's going to improve. Uh, while developing the film, a Universal departed from any street racing elements of the last four films and turned the franchise into a heist action series, like I was talking about, involving calls. And this was kind of in hopes to attract wider audiences that might be otherwise put off by a heavy emphasis on calls and automobile culture, which feels like a sad betrayal of the roots of the franchise, but here we are. In Fast Five, there was much more attention to generic action set pieces, gunfights, brawls, and the heist. Except in this movie, vehicles are involved. Like, cool muscle calls, because the main trait of almost all these people is that they like calls and that they're good drivers, and that's about it. Further craziness, Fast Five was initially conceived to conclude the franchise, but... Following strong box office performance and high critical 
praise. I mean, Universal proceeded to develop a sixth installment, and the franchise continues today. And throughout the next couple movies, there are also bouts of really generic, self-referential humor. Like many times, Roman will say something like, but wait, we just drive calls. Surely we can't steal a four-ton bank safe and cable it to the back of our calls and become bank robbers. And then this is usually the point where I yell at the screen in my head, screaming, yes, you actually can't do that. And pointing it out for a cheap joke does not justify the action. But, you know, I'm the one watching this. So this is the first film for me that is hard to swallow as it feels like a tonal shift of the franchise that is clearly working in the box office, but just not for me. Though there are some really cool bits in this movie too, and I don't want to forget that. I don't want to just come on here and wreck a movie and move on. Because, you know what? The opening scene is pretty exciting and awesome to watch. I mean, plus the location change to having most of the movie set in Rio, that's pretty cool. I really like that. It's fun. It's new. Uh, the addition of Elsa Pataki to the cast is cool, and her character will be developed in a pretty tasteful way moving forward, I think, as her and Dom have nice chemistry together. And also the banter between Dom and Paul Walker is also on point. But notice the similarity in these compliments. Within those equations, whether it's Elsa Pataki or Paul Walker, they both include Dominic Toretto. Vin Diesel, and I'll say this now so I don't forget, Vin Diesel has always been one of the best parts of this franchise. But moving forward, Vin Diesel is the best part of this franchise. The only reason I give these movies a chance is, and buy into them at all is the point that you can tell Vin Diesel himself buys into them. Dominic Toretto cares so much about his family and this world and that shines through more and more on every movie. And it's thanks to Vin Diesel's performance that really kind of brings it all together. And I just gotta hand it to him. So, moving on. F6, Fast and Furious 6. I want to run through this one chronologically. In 2013, film starts off where the last one left off, with Dom and Paul Walker racing... But they are in fact driving to the birth of Paul Walker's child and Dom's little nephew or niece. And that scene is followed with an entire visual recap of the previous franchise over the opening credits. And man, after watching all those in pretty close succession, I did not need this. Reminded me how different the franchise is now, but the change shown to me within a short, concentrated three minutes. It's grating, and I just wish I was watching the first one again. The film ends up following Dom, Paul Walker, and the crew, hired now by their old adversary Agent Hobbs, The Rock, to help stop a new antagonist, Owen Shaw, played by actor Luke Evans, and his team. And one of the members of that team is none other than, oh my goodness, Letty Ortiz. And ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Rodriguez is back. Thank goodness. But sadly, they did this thing where she has memory loss, so she can't remember anyone, and slowly as she interacts more and more with people, she starts to remember the family and love she had for Dom, and overall, it's a weak character arc, which doesn't fully ruin Letty as a character, but it gets damn near close. This is the first film that really sets off the globe-trotting portion of the franchise, where they don't just shack up in one international city for the whole movie but in fact jump around and have a convenient home base that they just kind of brush over how they get back to every time. And again, this will be essentially how they do it moving forward. Notice how these films slowly find more and more ways to become formulaic? My theory? It's so they're easier to write and produce, and they're able to come out on time, two years after one another, which feels like a ridiculous production schedule, considering the things they accomplish and shoot in each movie. Considering that one of those years is probably only editing and marketing, it makes sense that Vin Diesel's only other significant role in any other movie kind of comes in the form of a three-word line repeated over and over, I am Groot. And if you didn't know that Vin Diesel voiced Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, then you'll be even more excited to know that he is basically reprising his role as Iron Giant to do it. And if you didn't know Vin Diesel was the Iron Giant, you gotta start watching more Vin Diesel movies. So overall, you know, this is a continuation of the issues of Fast Five, but honestly in greater force. 
I got to give this a U tier for unfavorable, unfortunate. But hey, you know, as always, there are some notable moments. The sequence of Paul Walker in jail with John Ortiz's character, that's really cool. And at the end, this is a spoiler, but the team succeeds for the most part. And Hobbs, impressed by their work, says to Dom, Name your price, Dom. Thirteen twenty-seven. And then there was a shot of their home in Los Angeles, which, upon earning their freedom, they are allowed to return to the U.S. and live in their family home again. And it's super nice because the address was thirteen twenty-seven, and you're like, oh, it makes sense. The YouTube video that I took, the auto clip, has a great summation of how the film ends. So thank you, Furious Movies YouTube page, for that. This is a quote. Dom and the others return to his old family home in Los Angeles. Hobbs and Elena, Elsa Pataki's character, now working together, arrive to confirm the crew's freedom. Elena accepts that Dom now loves Letty, because Dom and Elena kind of had a thing in the last movie. As Roman says grace over the crew's meal, Dom asks Letty, Any of this feel familiar to you? And she answers, No. But it feels like home. And man, it's probably the most wholesome ending of any of these films, to be honest. So it has that going for it. But it kind of rips that away with a crazy mid credit scene, which we had luckily avoided up to this point in the movies, but here we are, adding scenes in the mid credits for fun. Like future trailers, essentially, where we are shown the original scene in Tokyo Drift, where Han is killed. And who should step out of the call but Jason Statham. Dominic Toretto. You don't know me. You're about to. So, this kind of leads us on to the next film. Number 7. Fast and Furious 7 is a weird beast for me. Because I can start this section off saying right away that this is my least favorite film so far. I mean, this is the worst one. Almost by a long shot. And I'm giving it right now the begrudging T tier. Terrible. And I am sorry for that. And sadly, my inverse relationship of enjoyment to the box office numbers continue because at a budget of $190 million, this film was able to gross, and oh my goodness, prepare yourself for this, $1.5 billion. Billion. With a B. <laughs> Again, somehow, essentially doubling the profit of the last movie, which already blew the other one out of the water, by grossing almost $790 million. And then F7 comes around like that's nothing. And again, F7 now holds as the ninth highest grossing international film of all time. And we still have two of these movies to go. But for further studio context, Universal lacked a major event film for 2014 and rushed Furious 7 into pre-production in mid-2013 due to its status as, well, a bankable asset. Uh, Justin Lin, the director of the past three, four, four films maybe at this point, decided not to return to direct the seventh film as he was still performing post-production on Fast and Furious 6. Universal reached out to James Wan, who is primarily known for horror films, to take over directing duties on this one. So, the story. Deckard Shaw a rogue special forces assassin seeking to avenge his comatose younger brother Owen, the main antagonist from the last movie, puts Dominic Toretto and his team in danger once again. So what we ought to believe is that Deckard Shaw's first step to his revenge plan was in fact killing Han. And maybe it's the lack of Justin Lin or perhaps the further issues that come on with this movie as we'll talk about it. This thing is an unruly mess, but to be honest, and more so than the previous two times, it really earns that unruly designation. I mean, here, the visual effects are even less rooted in reality, I mean, pushing that action-fiction theme we were talking about earlier. 
And Deckard Shaw, played by Jason Statham, essentially is a Superman who can go toe-to-toe with Dwayne The Rock Johnson all over the movie. Uh, the com- the comedic relief is laughably unfunny and is just a real detriment to the film, in my opinion. I guess it just continues to not work for me. And this is also the first film that has this really smooth camera work. Like, it feels very synthetic. Like, I think way more video editing went along with the visual effects in this movie. Not just CGI and visual effects in general. But part of the appeal of these movies was that they actually found some really cool ways to use shaky cam without making audience members, like, vomit. They found some cool ways to keep continuity, and the viewer wouldn't specifically get lost in the moment. And I'm not saying it panned out every time, but often it was pretty cool to watch how they would shoot these movies. So F7 definitely feels like a squeaky clean, high-budget studio film that leaves very little on the table of actual grittiness. And those movies aren't gritty action movies anymore. They just feel too polished. This is where the franchise has gotten to. I mean, just look at the Dubai sequence in the film. It's beautiful, opulent, polished, and honestly quite unrelatable. The opulence and just braggadocious nature of wealth and beauty is on display, but it's no longer in the attainable hands of the everyman on the street with his call, you know? It's now in the hands of billionaire Arab businessmen. And granted, the objectification of women and shameless boasting of wealth did really get to me, but at least it was done by characters that felt like actual people. Like, these were communities that could be found anywhere. The movie was essentially saying that you could be in a community like this, and that the coolest ones in this community, Dom Toretto, Han Su, and Paul Walker, don't do it for the money or the women, they do it for family and acceptance. And now, that really is gone, as Paul Walker and Dom crash a, quote, super call through two skyscrapers in Dubai, midair, essentially flying from building to building to building, which, oh boy, I mean, it's things like these that just make me feel that this franchise has gotten out of control with what they say calls can do, because the problem with having all your characters be racers and call mechanics and overall just call enthusiasts is that their main personality trait is is that. That's all you have. So you have to either A, add new characters with different skills, which they do. Ludacris's character Tej becomes kind of a hacker techno whiz. And they also add Natalie Emmanuel of Game of Thrones fame to the cast as another hacker. Or option B, continue to come up with more and more unrealistic things that calls can do to continue to try and one-up the stakes of the last movie as if it's not going to work. Which at this point, let's be honest, every harebrained idea they try will work. You're not fooling anyone. But overall, F7 stands as a rough film to get through, and I can't help that the disjointed story and lack of cohesion comes down to one very sad fact. And that is on November 30th, 2013, Paul Walker, the actor, died in a car accident with only one half of the film being shot up to that point. And following his death, filming was delayed for script rewrites, and his brothers Caleb and Cody were used as stand-ins to complete his remaining scenes, and the script rewrites completed the story arcs of both Walker and Brewster's characters, where they were now married and had kids. The visual company that did Lord of the Rings, Weta Digital, was hired to recreate Walker's likeness, The film also introduced Natalie Emanuel to the cast, and ultimately, it was tough trying to put all these pieces together. New characters, and having to make up with the loss of Paul Walker, ultimately it delayed the film, and it wasn't released until April 2015. And honestly, most of the praise of this film was being aimed at the film's action sequences, and also its emotional tribute to Paul Walker right at the end. Which for me, I mean, those final few minutes is the saving grace of the film. And it's also the saddest point that the death of Paul Walker reminds me what is best about this franchise. Something that I feel has continued to silently grow more and more is that theme of family, you know, inside and outside of the film. I mean, these people have continued to grow into what seems like a strong familial bond. 
And those connections can be felt through the films. And everyone involved, you know, there's this passion to be part of a project like this for the sake of being together and making movies. And this is easily one of the most impactful things about this movie in particular because the loss of Brian O'Connor is as impactful as the death of Paul Walker to Vin Diesel and the Fast and Furious family. So after the loss of one of the pillars of this franchise, I mean, there was this shared loss and mourning and knowing that there was more of these on the way, more Fast and Furious movies after this, I mean, who could say what was coming next? Well... That brings us to the next film, 2017's The F Eight of the Furious, the eighth installment of the series. But at this point in the franchise, watching these over multiple weeks, I'm kind of mentally exhausted. I don't know. It's hard to see a franchise go the direction it does and continue, in my opinion, just this downward spiral that lessens the effect of every film before it adding on to a legacy of generic themes, uninventive action sequences, more and more dizzying cinematography, and just straying further away from any meaningful narrative roots that it once had. But as I put on F8 and sat back with open expectations, something weird happened again, and it's that I started liking it a lot the biggest budget film yet, and by the logic, it should be one of the ones I like the least, if the trend I had set were to continue, but no, I legitimately was enjoying the F8 of the Furious, and it stands as one of my personal favorites in the entire franchise. And I will hold by this fact, this feels like a good old movie. The story follows as such, cyber terrorist Cypher, played by Charlize Theron, coerces Dominic Toretto into working for her and turns him against his team, forcing them to take down Cypher and Dom to reunite with him. After having Vin Diesel really change his arc for this film and have to go against family, go against everything he's worked for, and knowing he now remains as my favorite part of this franchise, his honest-to-God acting chops are flexed in this one completely for the better. And the story for me is intriguing and gratifying, which I know critics didn't like the story, and I, I can understand why. And it, and it feels like the progression of all these characters hits such a fever pitch where everyone is in perfect balance almost. I don't know, Roman is no longer the sole comedic relief because you have the stoic yet wisecracking and charming Deckard Shaw involved and Agent Hobbs. Dwayne The Rock Johnson kind of embracing a more fun, witty, charming side of himself in the character, something that felt quite lacking in past films. Now, the thing is the toll of multiple reshoots on F7 really dissuaded James Wan from returning to the franchise, and Universal hired F. Gary Gray to now helm the eighth film, The Fate of the Furious, and this film is to begin a new trilogy which would conclude the franchise. Diesel announced that introducing Kurt Russell, who has a character Mr. Nobody, and Charlize Theron as characters in Furious 7 would help to reach this. And maybe this is what the franchise needed. You know, because I was a little excited going into F7 knowing that James Wan could serve as a new set of eyes, stylistically, visually, narratively, just to be a fresh take on the franchise, but that, for me, very much did not pan out. However, F. Gary Gray essentially brought into the franchise a truly more dynamic way of looking at what makes a Fast and Furious movie work. And it was pretty great. I mean, there's also a sense that by this point, and I don't know how, the outlandish stunts and ridiculous premises are at their most palatable. And the film isn't trying to come off as torn between its origins and where it wants to go, creating a mixed monster of a movie, but in fact it seems to have embraced the idea of action fiction, and really st just starting to ask, hey, how can we do all this stuff super well with nuance and excitement? So yeah, I am here to give this thing a W tier, worth a watch. Yet, they may, it may have to come with an asterisk because some things in this movie are effective merely for the context I've now given myself with these past seven movies. So it's hard to say if Worth a Watch is actually worth a watch without the rest of the movies, but 
I'll just say I happen to like it quite a bit. And yeah, that leaves us with one remaining Fast and Furious film. Or does it? Because in 2015, Vin Diesel announced a potential spin-off. Actually, three potential spin-offs that were in the early development. And in 2019, the first spin-off arrived. Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Jason Statham as those title characters, reprising them from the original franchise. Originally, the ninth film was supposed to be released in April 2019, followed by the 10th in April 2021, but instead, Universal opted to proceed with the spin-off to occupy the 2019 release date. So, how does a spin-off starring supporting characters, which exist as somewhat opposite sides of the same action movie character coin, go? I mean, you have The Rock, a stoic, wisecracking, yet personable good guy in Agent Hobbs, and then Jason Statham, a stoic, wisecracking, yet personable bad guy, and boy, do they not get along, oh boy, um... Very much, you know, kind of an odd couple-esque dynamic, though expect they're not really being that different, you know? I mean, I guess one is British and the other's a dad, so, you know, there's different stuff there. But yeah, how does it go over for audiences? I can say, personally, better than it ought to have. You know, I think the film's a pretty overall boring action fiction film with Idris Elba as the main antagonist in the most unrealistic, physics-defying Superman character of all time. I mean, the plot follows as such. Luke Hobbs and Deckard Shaw team up with Shaw's sister, Hattie, played by Vanessa Kirby, to battle cybernetically enhanced terrorist Brixton Lowell, Idris Elba, threatening the world with a deadly virus, which honestly vague world-ending techno-virus device thing is kind of Paul for the course for any big-budget action fiction film in the later 2010s. Honestly, the new Charlie's Angels kind of comes to mind when I say that, and it, it does get real tiring real quick, as at a point I think the public is a bit numb to generic world-ending devices, and they feel so dime a dozen, and I wish I didn't have to say dime a dozen about world-ending devices, especially when almost all these movies are very averse to actually showing any of the real damage that might get done if these devices go off. We only see the hero save the day just in time for the studio to not have to pay to CGI global pandemonium. Overall, I do give this a V tier for very average. It's mostly a narratively unoffensive action film with fun, established characters and pithy one-liners that come off pretty well about half the time, which is the most I can ask for. And this also is one more of the culturally diverse action films, especially in this franchise. Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Jason Statham being producers on the project They feel heavily involved, having kind of a British half of the film, and then a Samoan half. And how cool is it that so much of the film gets to take place in Dwayne Johnson's mother's homeland of Samoa? And it feels like such a cool inclusion of Samoan culture, something we do not often see in big-budget films. Though the announcement of the spinoff did lead to tensions of the main Fast and Furious cast, and The Rock probably won't be returning for any more films in the franchise, which is too bad, he did say that he's expected to potentially be part of a Hobbs and Shaw 2, where Dwayne Johnson is quoted as saying, this is the film Hobbs walks off into the sunset, which I'll say it is an exciting prospect. But okay. Here we are, at the end of this long, long journey, over 20 years, building to this film, right here, F9. The movie I watched in June, and rewatched less than 48 hours ago. Which is also when I started scripting this damn thing, and it's so long, oh my goodness. But okay, one thing. I've been kind of calling these movies F1, F2, F3, F4 for my own sanity, and hopefully... You always know which movie that we're talking about here, but this film is actually called just straight up F9. But here is a recap of what each movie is called in order of release. Here we go. The Fast and the Furious, Too Fast, Too Furious, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift, 
Fast and Furious, Fast 5, Fast and Furious 6, Fast 7, The F8 of the Furious, and F9. And really the only one that gets me there is just the fourth movie, Fast and Furious. Just just do Fast 4 or Fast and Furious 4 or like, I, I, I don't know, it just, it just gets to me. But now I need to ask myself the question that started off all of this. Was this film any better or any worse upon having the context of the first, geez, eight films? With so many cast changes, additions, losses, new stories, old stories recycled, new visual effects, new set pieces, and working to continue the narrative of F7 and F8 with Deckard Shaw and eventually now Cypher as returning antagonists, and the addition of John Cena as Dom Toretto's disowned brother Jacob. What do I think? Overall, I think the answer is... No? Kinda? Sort of. I, th- I enjoyed it the same amount. And if I had to say, I don't think it's any better or any worse upon having the context of these films. If anything, it is a little better for the fact that F8 made me truly feel that we've hit the franchise's second wind. Third wind, if you include the one-two punch reboot of F5 and F6, but I don't. This movie is fun, well shot, absolutely insane, and not annoyingly over the top, despite being very much over the top. Essentially, Dom and the crew are back to do battle with Jacob Toretto, who was banished from LA after Dom and him had a falling out in their youth, reacting to the death of their father. And we are actually shown this with various flashbacks to their turbulent youth, throughout the entire movie, which is pretty great to finally get some honest visual backstory on the Toretto family, and the narrative structure just works super well. It's a really great balance. Every time you kind of forget that there's going to be a flashback, there is a flashback, and you're like, oh yeah, we're learning about his past at the same time. On the other half of this movie, there's Cypher, who is now in pseudo-custody, and she essentially leans into this tension between Dom and Jacob and pulls strings from her plastic cell to help bring about further tension and kind of to get to work on her dastardly plans of world domination back on track. I, at least I think so. I don't I don't really know what her motives are, but they're they're dastardly. I know that. Just generic bad guy justification and fake deep pontificating on humanity's shortcomings and whatever. That's kind of her bag. But there's essentially three big portions of this movie. Uh, Monte Quinto in South or Central America, I believe. Tokyo slash Edinburgh, Scotland, which they kind of cut back to concurrently. And Tbilisi in the Caucasus, which kind of where that's where the third act plays out. And you know what? It is a fun, globetrotting action fiction movie that knows pretty much what it wants to be. And and I'm here for it, and I have to give it a W tier, worth a watch. And I don't want to talk this one over too much, but that's how I feel about it. For a quick kind of monetary conclusion to the other half of my story, essentially how it ended up going was the fate of the Furious cost $250 million, and it was able to gross $1.2 billion. And F9, obviously still dealing with a bit of a bump of uh, losing viewership during the pandemic, made on a budget of $200 million, shot in 2019, released 2021, still being able to garner $721 million, pretty much right on with Fast and Furious 6, and only made for $40 million more. And right now, it actually stands at number four for the highest grossing films in 2021. Right now, uh, that is only surpassed at the number three, No Time to Die, which actually just surpassed it. And that's it. Uh, It has been announced that there will be a final Fast and Furious movie, but split into two parts. So basically, F10 and F11. 
being released in 2023 and TBA, respectively. And I gotta say, with the latest outpouring of the franchise, I am damn excited for it. Despite its flaws and missteps, this is such a unique franchise in how it's adapted to the modern action movie environment that has radically changed over the past 20 years. I mean, you look at a movie, an action movie from the early 2000s, you're not going to see that same kind of movie today. And it shows that it's been able to evolve with the times, despite not really being my favorite movies at times, but I think now, 2021, it's come out the other side with bringing together some cool scenes, fun movies, witty lines, and I'll say it, family. <laughs> so thank you for, jour- for, for journeying with me into the deep deep darkness that is the Fast and Furious franchise. There's, there's a lot to talk about, and it even feels like I skipped out on some big stuff, you know? But again, this isn't, this isn't a deep dive analysis. This is a tier list. I wanted to kind of show the progression of how I think these movies have gone, and hopefully it was effective. Um, as always, the movies we talk about on this show will be on my letterbox list my letterbox account, DA underscore N, linked below if you're listening on YouTube, but DA underscore N for those of you listening on the radio. All the movies we talk about on the first four seasons of Film and are also on Cranberry 18's letterbox list. Um, C R A N D Berry 18, owned by our previous host, Connor. Connor, I hope you're doing good out there in Indiana. I hope. The holiday season is treating you well. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I will be back next week with something hopefully less long and something that will make me not want to uh, stress eat or something. I don't know. I just need to to take a break. I will be enjoying this coming turkey day. This is obviously coming to you all Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. But I will have just eaten a very delicious Thanksgiving dinner and will hopefully be in a tryptophan coma so I don't have to think about uh, having to do another one of these episodes. Not that I don't love it, but man, I could use a break. uh, You know, with work and the semester and all that, I am very tired. But I hope you all enjoyed the episode. So you will hear from me next week. 